Well, let's, so with that as a background, we'll move on to complications. And this will be, this will be last, uh, the last talk. And, and, uh, and what are the real cost of complications? What, what's, what's the impact? And, uh, and, and I'll, I'll share, and with, with some examples, maybe some case examples again. Uh, so one of the things I want to start with is the notion of variability. And there's a, a lot of variability in how we describe complications, how we describe the, the severity of complications, something that's a major or minor, and that can be somewhat arbitrary. And also, uh, what, what are the published rates of complications? I touched on this a little bit in my introductory talk, and I'm going to go through that data in a little more detail uh, in, in this talk. And I think there is some, some utility to a systematic categorization. And again, one of the reasons that it's so important to really understand complications and the severity and impact is that uh, it really helps us with this risk-benefit ratio, is that the risk uh, of a surgery is uh, largely defined by uh, the potential complications and the appropriateness of doing an intervention. You really want to understand what the complication profile might be. And again, as a quality of care metric, this is important. And, and as an outcome variable, you know, the most common predictive models that we've built have been on uh, uh, perioperative complications. So things like uh, the rates of PJK. So many of you know that the GAP score was associated with uh, mechanical failure. Um, rates of uh, readmission, reoperation, those, those complications were uh, some of our most powerful predictive models. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll suggest to you, uh, classification system that, that, that I'm working on developing uh, with, with some others uh, that really quantifies both the severity and, and the impact of complications. So, so now when we think about a complication, there's all sorts of words we use, you know, major, minor, uh, expensive complication, a serious complication, an impactful complication, a transient complication, right? So the BMP, well, Jeff's describing a transient problem, but for those three months since he's got a ridiculitis, that's a pretty miserable time. Uh, permanent complication versus transient, uh, devastating complications. So, so I, I think uh, to some extent those are really subjective assessments. And a lot of evidence suggests that the uh, physician's assessment of a complication is very different than the patient's assessment of a complication. So those words are very different words uh, for the phys physician and the patient. Uh, so again, defining this is important. Complications are a really important metric for our quality of care. And they're critical for defining what the risks are of interventions and the appropriateness of interventions. So I think understanding complications is really fundamental to us helping empower patients to make informed choices. And the rate and, and impact of complications really are highly variable. So the, the goal of creating a system that might work is to systematically care categorize uh, um, uh, for comparison of alternative treatment options. So for example, if you were to say, I'll do a discectomy MIS versus uh, open, and my uh, risk of a dural tear might be higher with an MIS surgery, as, uh, as Justin has suggested, yet my uh, uh, risk of a uh, infection is higher with an open uh, surgery, you know, how do we rate the impact of, of each of those? Uh, to some extent, we want to know what the duration of symptoms might be, whether or not further treatment would be required, would this require another surgery or prolonged hospitalization? How is this going to overall affect my outcome and my improvement of health status? Am I going to uh, uh, perhaps uh, have permanent loss of, 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 uh, of, of function in some way? And what's the overall cost of care going to be uh, uh, for the patient, for the payer, and for the hospital? Um, again, complications are an important variable in, in our predictive models and maybe one of the most common variables in our predictive models. And finally, to guide an evidence-based approach to how we make decisions in an informed way. Um, so knowledge of complications is important. When we think about the spectrum of things that can happen in terms of perioperative complications, certainly some of the more devastating would be neural problems, uh, cardio, cardio, cardiopulmonary problems. But virtually any system within the body can be affected by complications. And this is our, our complication sheet right now, quite complex here, but it goes through neural, cardiac, pulmonary, GI, uh, renal and genital urinary, hematologic, infectious, endocrine, uh, skin problems, musculoskeletal problems, implant-related problems, anesthetic complications, and, and then finally, uh, death is on there as well. And then within each of those categories, some choices, and we're, we were trying to create a way to systematically capture these complications without just using free text, because when you start putting free text into a medical record, it's virtually impossible to search. So when we're actually looking at uh, outcomes research, we, we try to uh, uh, have a limited uh, data set on that. So one of the questions becomes, what's an acceptable rate of, of complications? And, and um, you know, to some extent, we, we all live in, in glass houses, and an acceptable rate is, is, gives us an idea of, of what is the ex expected rate. And, and I think uh, that's really got to be viewed in a risk-stratified way. So the uh, 
uh, rate of infection, for example, uh, in a primary discectomy is very different than what we might expect for a rate of infection of somebody uh, who's got a myeloid dysplasia and a major spinal reconstruction. And fundamentally, our uh, uh, ratio of what's observed, of what we observe as a rate of complication compared to what's expected, is what a true metric of quality is. And unless we have some standardization or some stratification of the expected rates, then suddenly uh, it, it becomes impossible to uh, really use complication rates as a metric of quality. So we really want to compare like with like to give benchmarking for these numbers to make any sense. Now, when we try and figure out what an acceptable rate is, well, there's a lot of variability in this literature. And I, I went through this very briefly uh, 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 on the first day, but I, I just want to point out some of the dramatic differences that you might see. And, and I, um, a broad spectrum of reported rates of, of neural injury, of infections, and this is really indicating some of the limitations of our data sets. And um, the SRS database has been a major uh, source of information on complications. And I had already alluded to this reference, but it's pretty dramatic. Uh, we, uh, in this paper, had suggested that in the F SRS m and registry, the rate of infection for uh, uh, adult scoliosis surgery was 1.5% uh, for deep infections, and the rate of neurologic injuries after surgery was 1%. And if you were to say, well, that's the expected rate, then that might be a benchmark that's probably inappropriate when you actually look at more rigorous studies. So this study, Jens Chapman, a group up in Seattle, uh, their infection rate for uh, adult deformity surgery, these are patients fused in the thoracic spine and the pelvis, 17%. Now that might be a bit the other stream, but at the same time, uh, very different than the expected rate if you look at the uh, m, m database. Uh, their rate of neurologic injuries uh, uh, after surgery, acute neurologic deficits was 20%. This is a study I was uh, uh, the, the lead author on, uh, Larry Lenk was the uh, principal investigator on, but the Scully Risk Study. Uh, so this was uh, uh, 14 centers around the world, and these were all three column osteotomies, so either VCRs or PSOs. Uh, but the subset of patients who reported at least one point reduction in their lower extremity motor score, so they lost at least one grade in one myotome, was, was almost a quarter of patients after the surgery. And, and, and uh, at six months, there were still 11% of patients had, had at least one motor grade of deficit. And uh, the SRS database, again, suggested, well, that number ought to be somewhere around 1%. Well, a dramatic difference there in the rigor with which we do these studies, uh, it, it gives us uh, dramatic differences in expectations. I think it's really important to set a benchmark that's appropriate. We were part of this study with the ISSG, 70% of patients with multi-level adult deformity surgery having uh, some uh, perioperative complication or at least one complication. And again, honing in on neurologic deficits, 27% of patients had either a perioperative or a delayed neurologic deficit. Infection, 15% of patients with an infection. So suddenly, what, what is the standard? What should the goal be? Is, is, uh, what, what is the quality metric that's, uh, that's important? And I think it's really important when we think about uh, reporting rates of complications as these are a quality metric in our risk sharing payment systems. These are a quality metric within our hospital. Uh, who gets a quarterly or, or more report on, on what your infection rate is compared to your peers? Who gets that every, every quarter? Yeah. And Well, I published that, Jeff. What are you talking about? I, I told you the SRS database was 1.5%. That's probably where it came from. <laughs> it's brutal. And they say, well, we're, we're, we're adjusting it for the morbidity and all of this kind of stuff, but it's... it's uh, yeah, so, so the case mix adjustment is the adjustment that's done. It's called the CMI. And the CMI is based on the length of surgery, uh, meaning how long the surgery is. Uh, it's based on... Um, the, whether it's a revision surgery or a primary surgery, and it's based on the approach, so whether it's an uh, anterior approach or a posterior approach. And uh, all of us know that there's so much more that goes into it, right? The patient who's had prior infection, uh, the patient who's had prior radiation, uh, the patient who's had a, 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 a prior pseudoarthrosis, the patient with myelodysplasia, and, and none of that gets figured into the, the CMI. So my confidence in risk stratification is extremely limited, and this was you know, another issue for Scott, but when we think about our insurance companies creating a narrow network and say, you know what, we want to send our patients to Hogue because they've got a terrific uh, 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 quality metrics, but we've got to take Decky out of it. Um, and and you're, you're at risk of that because of the ability to risk stratify these cases.
So, so that, that's, I think, a really important issue in terms of establishing appropriate benchmarks. And, and I think some of these studies, like the ISSG work, uh, some of the IDE trials that uh, show much higher rates of complication for ACDS, for example, uh, one of the numbers we saw was uh, a 13, almost 14% revision rate within two years for ACDS. That, that, to me, seems excessive. But when you really look at the outcomes, that's, that, those, are, those are real numbers. I think 14% same level, whereas is, is uh, Dr. Alexander still here, but that was a, a pretty, pretty daunting number. Well, what about the impact of complications and how do we quantify the severity? So is this like a meteor hitting the earth or is this like water off a duck's back? And, uh, and so quantifying this uh, uh, severity to some extent, uh, we've worked with the system to base the severity on the treatment required. We could also look at the severity in terms of the clinical outcome, is how much of an impact does this have on long-term health status, and, and what's the actual economic outcome, so what's the cost to the hospital. And, and what, what's interesting here is that when we think about the classification that we've used in many studies in the past, major complications, minor complications, that's awfully subjective. And in general, what the surgeon considers a minor complication, the patient actually considers a major complication. Um, and, and in uh, poor correlations with outcomes. So here's some work out of the ISSG looking at patients with adult spinal deformity. And uh, the suggestion here was that minor complications had little impact on health status within a year, but major complications had a, a significant and measurable impact at a year. So for example, a CSF leak, excessive bleeding, um, uh, intraoperative coagulopathy, a uh, vertebral body fracture, uh, postoperative radiculopathy, uh, skin complication, um, uh, a DVT, superficial infection, uh, a seroma, the, uh, uh, the DVT again, those, those were considered minor complications. And at a year, there wasn't a measurable decrement in health status, uh, as opposed to some of the more major things, patients with a cardiac arrest, patient dying, well, that doesn't, doesn't change much at a year. Uh, uh, pneumonia, a major neurologic deficit, those were associated with, with problems. Uh, this is an interesting study that was done out of the, uh, the Spine Adverse Events uh, Severity System. This was uh, a study done out of Toronto, uh, but multiple centers from around the world. And, and what they did is they did a, a systematic way of trying to actually uh, quantify complications. So each of these centers had a uh, nurse whose specific job was to actually fill out a complication sheet. And this was a full-time job to actually document the complications. And uh, the slide that's not in here said that uh, prior to this in Canada, the reported rate of complications overall from the Canadian Spine Society for uh, patients hospitalized after lumbar fusion surgery was 23%. And when they actually hired a nurse in each of these centers to look at this, the uh, rate of complications was actually closer to 90%. Uh, so major differences in how rigorously we look at this. This was a, a study that uh, Raj Raprashan did out of, out of Toronto based on the SAVE system, and they graded some of these adverse events by the impact, and they said, well, a grade one is no treatment required, a minimal treatment required, and a grade four is, is a death, and uh, a, a grade three is something that really has expected sequelae that last for more than six months. So, so you look at this and think, well, the more, uh, uh, the, the higher the grade, the, the worse the outcome. It was quite interesting, actually, the cost was interesting, is if you look at a grade three complication, it cost about $150,000. So these were complications that had sequelae that lasted more than six months, and to some extent, it's probably better for the patient to just die than to have a uh, grade three complication. So uh, probably not the result that, that we really wanna, wanna uh, have. So, so to that end, this is some work again done by the ISSG looking at the impact of complications. And again, uh, what they looked at here was they defined a major complication as one that required a reoperation and a minor one that didn't require a reoperation. And that was a pretty good distinction in terms of health status. The subset of patients that required a reoperation, either for mechanical failure or for an infection, uh, that subset of patients actually did worse at two year follow up than the subset of patients who didn't require a reoperation. So, that's one way to maybe define the severity of the complication. Here's a system that I've been working with. Is, uh, one is to describe the system. So this is a neural complication uh, involving a uh, uh, drop in motor score of three points, for example. And then the severity. So for non-neural complications, either it's no intervention required, uh, maybe the intervention would be relatively minor, so uh, diagnostic testing, maybe monitoring alone, maybe drawing some more labs, some minimal inter intervention like changing medications, um, uh, the next level would be a 
uh, a more invasive but non-surgical intervention, so uh, uh, um, something like a cardioversion, a, a filter placement, placement of a chest tube after surgery, and then a, some surgical intervention would be the, the highest level for non-neural complications. And for neural complications, we, we base this more on the actual motor score or whether or not there was a spinal cord injury um, and, and uh, whether or not that was complete or incomplete and involving the bowel or bladder. And then finally, uh, whether or not there was a resolution. So uh, at follow-up, at most recent follow-up, was this completely resolved? Was it a uh, 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 residual impairment that remains unresolved? Was this a impairment that we expect or has been a chronic impairment? And, and then finally, uh, is there death? And this was one way of, of, uh, of, of quantifying this. So, so I put this slide in here uh, uh, in terms of avoiding complications. Anybody, anybody ski to Park City uh, during this trip? There's a sign there, top of 99.90, that, that says uh, that you could die. So that, that's a good thing to avoid. I was skiing with, uh, uh, with a couple of people, including uh, uh, um, uh, a couple of innovations people, Brent. I, I'll report to you later who they were. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and we came near death today. <laughs> or or, or riding, a, riding a small chairlift. This is Cliff Tribune on a small chairlift here. That, that could be a risk of a complication as well. So, so what, what are some things that I think we could do to limit complications? And this color scheme is off, but I'll just go uh, through it briefly. And I think that there are some things that we do in terms of systems reform. You know, number one, preoperatively. We talked a bit on the first day about optimization of patients preoperatively. So um, uh, my preoperative optimization scheme is, is really not operating electively on patients with uh, hemoglobin A1C more than 7.5, uh, uh, osteoporosis, a BMI more than 35. That's a deficit, you know, I, I probably wouldn't operate electively on myself. Uh, serum albumin more than 3.5, uh, active smokers. These, these are things that I think we can do systems reform-wise to limit complications. Uh, intraoperatively, uh, um, some of the things that we've done a lot of work on is having standardized anesthesia teams. So who has one team uh, that reliably uh, does spine anesthesia in, in your center, and, uh, and then who on any given day may have uh, the uh, OBGYN person or sports person or spine person and on, on any given day. So I think uh, many of you know the, the frustration of uh, uh, trying to explain to somebody what the doses of transdecemic acid, for example, who are, or, or, or why we're not using halogenated anesthetics, or what our blood transfusion protocols are, or why we don't wait for an INR before we actually transfuse somebody. Uh, and so having an argument about whether or not to transfuse somebody, that I see some knowledgeable nods in the audience. And it really helps to have a dedicated anesthesia service and have established protocols so that we do the same thing every time. In terms of surgical techniques, you know, many of you know, one of the things that we did at UCSF is for most of our really complex surgery, for most of our three column osteotomies and, and most of our uh, uh, surgeries that uh, may have an expected duration of, of, of more than uh, five hours or so, or, or may have a, a high risk of a neurologic uh, uh, problem, we'll use uh, two attendings. We typically have ortho and neuro working together, and you know, Coy uh, was one of the fellows with us, and I, I think maybe saw some benefit to that. I think you know, it's interesting how there becomes a convergence in, in techniques where you know, I, I tend to do a lot of osteotomies with, with an osteotome, and I'll literally just take out big pieces of bone, and uh, my neurosurgery colleagues uh, uh, tend to just use, use a burr and burr out little fragments of bone. And, and we've actually converged to the point where, at least in the cervical spine, I, I use a burr uh, really uh, a, a lot. You know, I'll, I'll do on, on block laminectomies, kind of lobster laminectomies in the cervical spine with a burr, where, where I never used to do that sort of thing. And then uh, some of my partners in neurosurgery uh, make me nervous with how they use the osteotome. So we really uh, have, have some, uh, some convergence, some, some learning from one another, and that's been, been terrifically valuable. Who, who's routinely doing really complicated surgery with another attending level surgeon? Is that something that people have adopted in terms of uh, safety? And you know, certainly if, if I were uh, having a thoracic level VCR, I, I'd probably want to have more than one set of eyes in there. Um, <clears throat> and. Uh, um, so, you know, standardizing things in the operating room. Uh, Postoperatively, uh, a, a big part of this is early mobilization. So we've got, uh, we've got a special floor where I'd like to say all the spine patients go to, but it's always over full, so we get uh, half the patients boarding on another floor. But who's got a spine-specific floor with protocols for, for your patients? That's, I think it's really, if you want to think about an investment that the hospital can make to getting patients out of the hospital sooner, because that's, that's the argument that I make for everything from a nurse navigator to having a hospital, having a spine specific floor, is I make the argument in the hospital that I can show you a reduction in the length of stay. So I got a nurse navigator, two, two now nurse navigators, I got the hospital to pay for it, and what they do is they go through the preoperative preparation with the patient. 
And uh, one of the big things they do is they make sure that the patients actually uh, have an optimal chance of going home. Uh, we have less than 3% of our patients go to a SNF. About 20% of our patients go to uh, a, a rehab after surgery, uh, but close to 80% of our patients end up going home, and that requires a lot of preoperative preparation. But if we can get patients home, they're much less likely to be readmitted, and they actually don't hang around waiting for a rehab bed, uh, which costs a lot of money. So those are really strong economic arguments you can make to the hospital to having a, a spine-specific floor and a spine-specific team. Uh, we do a lot of work with early enteric feeding, early mobilization, uh, delirium pre prevention, and that results in some real benefits and reductions of complications uh, to the hospital. So I, I'm going to wrap up here because I've got five seconds left to say that uh, complications, especially in deformity surgery, but in, in uh, spine surgery in general, really are significant. And I think that it's important to classify complications, to understand what the impact is, what the cost is. And I think that we need to have a system that's really correlated with the clinical impact to the patient, that's correlated with the duration of the impact and whether or not people are going to recover or not, or if this is going to be a chronic problem, and the actual cost of the complication. And cost is such an important element of the equation when we're thinking about, the, again, predictive modeling and, and empowering both patients to make informed choices, but also empowering the hospital to say, is this a case that we're willing to take on? You know, is this something that if we're in an uh, uh, alternative payment model, if we're in a bundle payment, are we willing to assume the risk of a patient who might be in a hospital for, for two weeks, for, for three weeks, a patient who might have a permanent uh, a problem, who might have a high risk of reoperation? So we need to be able to quantify this, and I think it's becoming increasingly a priority for our healthcare system. Uh, I think we want to limit the burden of data capture, and, and you saw that in, in uh, the Canadian system when they hired a nurse who just looked at complications, the rate was uh, much higher than otherwise reported, but that's awfully expensive, and, uh, and that's a difficult system. We were part of the NISQIP database, and uh, the subset of patients, uh, the hospitals in the NISQIP system, again, had nurses that were routinely uh, collecting complications, and, and our, our uh, recognized complications by the NISQIP system were actually significantly higher than our departmental reported complications, uh, which was interesting. And then finally, I think it's awfully important to establish quality benchmarks because as we're looking into narrow network systems, as we're looking into our payer defining where the patient may go uh, and, and really quantifying risks and appropriateness of, of, of surgery, we want to know that maybe a 1.5% uh, complication rate uh, isn't appropriate for a complex revision adult deformity surgery. And uh, I think we've really got to work as a community to establish what are appropriate complications and, again, be appropriate stewards uh, to uh, uh, have, have a complication rate that really ought to be an appropriate goal. Uh, so being responsible about this, but at the same time being realistic. So that's what I wanted to share uh, today about, about complications. And um, I think we've got, we've got five minutes. Who, who wants to do one? one? I've, got a, I've got a whole folder of complication cases, <laughs> as, as you might imagine. Uh, so we have time for one, or we can head down to dailies. Do we want to do, do a complication case? Or? Brent says yes, Brent, and Brent, Brent, Brent's our host, so we'll do one. All right, here, here's, here's one that's, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a bit embarrassing to share complication cases, but this is a real one. This is a woman who, uh, at the time of her surgery, let me see, she's 78 years old, and uh, she's a socialite from San Francisco. What I mean by socialite is she's a friend of all the people who are friends of my wives and people who don't talk to me. Um, <clears throat> and uh, she presents with uh, this, this uh, thoracic kyphosis. So she's 78 years old. She lives independently. She's, if you've been to San Francisco, she lives in uh, one of the mansions that overlooks the bay. And she's a big philanthropist. And she said, she says, I'm getting progressively bent over, Doc. I'm, I'm having pain, difficulty standing upright. And uh, I've really worked on this. I've got a personal trainer. I've been doing physical therapy and exercises. I need narcotic pain medicines. And, and I'm getting more, more and more kyphotic with time. And it's, it's painful. So she's 78 years old. And uh, from T3 to T12, you know, I measured a 90-degree kyphosis, which, which seemed high. 78-year-old um, with a thoracic kyphosis. Um, so, so I went through some of the preoperative uh, uh, screening tools. And, and uh, this case was actually done before I, I developed this EMR system. But uh, you know, overall, she's actually a remarkably healthy woman. Her, her uh, BMI was uh, 20. Uh, she, she was osteoporotic. She had an insufficiency fracture, T10. Her uh, DEXA score was minus 2.5. She was on calcium and vitamin D. And uh, uh, um, at this time, I actually didn't put her on teriparatide. You'll see, I, I wish I, I had. Um, 
but otherwise a non-smoker. And uh, but but she was osteoporotic. I, I'm sorry. Her DEXA score was was minus 2.1, and she was on Forteo for 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 actually six months. Uh, but she'd had these prior compression fractures, and that's how I got her on Forteo. So despite the fact that her DEXA scan didn't qualify her, she had the insufficiency fractures. Um, so let me just start with this is what we do in our conferences. Is uh, I might present the case, and and then people will, will actually uh, rate. Uh, is this an appropriate surgery or not? So uh, uh, who, who wants to say that doing an operation, doing a reconstructive surgery in this room, patient would be totally inappropriate? So one to three. Who, who, who says that this is, wouldn't take this on, 78-year-old, otherwise healthy, thoracic kyphosis, you've got to live with it? All right. Well, I, I'll tell you. I, I said it was inappropriate. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you the whole story. It was inappropriate, I said. Who wants to say reasonable? I'd say bridging this, Bridging, okay. All right. <laughs> And who thinks that the, who's the, who thinks the expected benefit of this by far exceeds the expected risks? So, so we're probably in, in a yellow zone at best, right? So, so I said, I said no. I, I, I said no. I said I'm not going to do this. Uh, that, that, that's uh, we, we got to work further with physical therapy. We'll try some dynamic bracing. Even uh, we'll, we'll we'll work further on this. And uh, so she goes on to see uh, three different SRS presidents. She's pretty connected. You know, one of whom is David Bradford at the time was my senior partner, and she saw John Brown down in. in uh, Los Angeles, and I uh, saw another uh, person I won't mention, but, but uh, all three of them said, you know, tell Sig that I said he better do the surgery. And that's li literally what happened. All three of them said that. And, and, and so uh, being uh, uh, influenced or being influential, I, I ended up doing the surgery. I, I ended up uh, doing a fusion. I went from uh, T3 down to, I think, L, L3 on her. I tried to get to a, a vertebra that was... Uh, 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 bisected by the posterior sacral line, so I tried to really uh, get, get it uh, uh, to the bottom of her or, or lordosis. I went up to T3 with hooks on the top, and, uh, and, and initially everything was terrific. I put a little cement in that T10 vertebra where she had the fracture, and, and it was wonderful. The mare came to see her after surgery. She was so happy about standing up straight. Everything was wonderful, and, and uh, uh, I was getting all patted, patted on the back, and um, uh, having said that, and I actually even put some cement in, in T. Somebody asked about vertebral augmentation. I put some cement in, in L3. And, and, and I'll credit uh, David Bradford who actually came in to see her because he was a friend of hers as well. And, uh, and, and he said, Sig, why did you correct her so much, right? Why, why, did, you, uh, uh, why, why did you get her, get her so straight? You overcorrected her. And I said, oh, she's so happy. She's taller. Every, every, everything's just great. And uh, so she left the hospital, and, and, and things seemed fine until she came back four weeks after surgery. And she, all she said is, I, I've got some pain up here in my, in my neck at the top. It, it's just been a little bit painful. And uh, the fellow goes in to see her and says, oh, yeah, she seems to be doing okay. And, and it seems to be that I, I'm, I'm the one who always finds the problems. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, I, I go in to see her and looking at her pain and feel the prominent implants. And you, you can see from the plain films that she's got a proximal uh, junctural problem here. And uh, on the CT scan... Uh, you see a little bit better, is this is actually a really dangerous problem. This is uh, T3, is subluxated on T4, and this is associated with a high rate of neural problems as well. Luckily, she was neurologically intact, but I, I uh, changed my plans for that week. Friday, she came in, and I, I took her back to the operating room and, and uh, took her up to, in, in this instance, I, I took her up to C7 with pedicle, uh, uh, I, I did a PSO at three and, and took her up with pedicle screws to the top, and, uh, and that, that went well, that was all fine. But you might have noticed uh, that immediately after surgery, I had actually cemented these, these screws in the bottom. But despite the cement, she also developed uh, this distal junctional problem. That was pretty much asymptomatic. She said, oh, my neck bothers me, but my low back isn't so bad. So I kind of stuck my head in the sand for a while. I said, uh, I, the neck is enough. Uh, I'm not going to deal with the low back. And uh, she, she went another uh, uh, four weeks or so before she came back again uh, after leaving the hospital. And that, that's what it looked like in a CT scan. And, uh, and it, it progressively got worse. And now all of a sudden that, that, that became the major problem, right? Oh, yeah, Doc, I got some pain in my low back and this is really bothering me and I'm wishing I hadn't corrected her so much. Uh, so, so at this point, uh, I ended up doing, doing a VCR uh, from the back. I took out uh, L4 from the back and uh, got, got fixation down to the pelvis. I guess that's the last slide there. So that was a, 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 a pretty major complication. It had to do with, with junctional kyphosis. It had to do with uh, maybe surgery that was borderline uh, appropriate in the first place. I think that uh, one of the things that I've learned since is probably not to overcorrect, especially older patients with a kyphosis. The irony here is that uh, um, she is a... Uh, I'm, I'm on Facebook because 
Uh, I, I applaud Innovasis' efforts for social media. I, I do Facebook because I, I want to know what uh, kids are putting on there. But I've never actually posted it. I don't even know how to post it to myself. But she's a Facebook friend, so she sends me messages and still actually sends me birth birthday things, yeah, <laughs> she's a lot, a lot taller. And, and of all things, uh, she went on a couple of years ago uh, to, to break her hip and it immediately called me and, and said, hey, hey Doc, I, I broke my hip and she lives up in Napa and I'm gonna come down and want you to fix my hip. And, and as you might imagine, I got somebody else to, to fix her hip after that. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up with that, everybody. So uh, I'm gonna let uh, Brent or Mike, do you wanna have, have the last word here, Russ? Who's, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll let the last word then. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. What I think was really special about this year was uh, a lot of interaction, a lot of discussion with the cases. Uh, I really thought that some of the healthcare economic stuff, getting people's perspectives on that. I think what's special about this meeting is the diversity of people that we have coming, the diversity of, of experience, a lot of very experienced people, diversity of, of, of the practices we're coming from. I really liked Mike's session on the pediatric and adult uh, working together, so much we can learn from each other. And I think that's what really makes this spe meeting special is, is learning from one another. Uh, so I really thank uh, Brent for, for hosting this, uh, CJ, Mike, and, and the crew here for really doing a terrific job, Andy, for, for uh, making this run well. And uh, we'll have uh, further time together tonight. So there's a gathering in Daly's Pub. I didn't know there was bowling down there. I've actually not, not been in there, but I guess there's bowling and some other activities. I suspect that there'll be beer and uh, healthy food. And uh, hopefully I'll see everybody downstairs. So thanks again for, for coming.